Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. In today's video, I'm going to be tackling all of the Goosebumps Slappy World books, and there are 20 of them. There are 19 regular Goosebumps Slappy World books and one special edition, so that makes 20 books. And yes, I will be reading them all in this video, just like I did with the original Goosebumps series, the series 2000 series, the Horrorland and Hall of Horror series, and the Most Wanted series. So this is the fifth episode of my Goosebumps postmortem, and essentially it's a series where I reread the Goosebumps books by R.L. Stein for the first time as an adult. I had only ever read the original Goosebumps series and the series 2000 series when I was a child, but I actually read the Horrorland, Hall of Horrors and the Most Wanted series for the first time as an adult. But nevertheless, these are all my opinions and I totally understand I am an adult, so these books are not targeted towards me anymore, but I still absolutely love Goosebumps so, so much. And this as well is a celebration of the brand new Disney Plus TV show, which I haven't watched yet. Please do let me know down below if you've watched the TV show yet. I'm so excited, but also the original 90s television show means so much to me. It has such a huge place in my heart that I don't really know if anything can compare, but I'm willing to give it a go. I, again, love Goosebumps with everything I have, but feel free to share your opinions down below. I would love to hear from you. The Goosebumps Happy World series ran from 2017 to 2023 and only ended a few months ago. Honestly, it's perfect timing for me since I have been going through each of the main Goosebumps series for the past two years, and this is the last complete main series that I need to read. The House of Shivers series has just began, and obviously I won't be to do a complete reading vlog for it because it will probably go for a few more years but there are a couple of spin-off Goosebumps series like Tales to Give You Goosebumps and Give Yourself Goosebumps that I would maybe love to get to one day and I do have all the Tales to Give You Goosebumps books but I don't have the Give Yourself Goosebumps books and there are 50 of them and they are very very expensive so it's probably likely that I won't ever get to Give Yourself Goosebumps unfortunately but do still subscribe keep an eye out because you never know I would love to do them so never say never but yes the Slappy World series is the sixth and most recent one. The Slappy World series has a little bit of a gimmick a little bit of an edge to the series too. I know the Horrorland and Hall of Horrors books had the Horrorland aspect to it, so that was like a recurring thing. And then the Most Wanted series had the whole idea of, oh, these are the most wanted creatures in the Goosebumps universe. But I do hope the gimmick of the Slappy World series really helps elevate it and not hold it back. So the gimmick of the Slappy World series, and I do still believe that each of the books are individual, but there is that running thing of Slappy being the one to tell you his twisted version of scary stories. I hope though that we still have a lot of scary books, those are the ones that I love the most, rather than the comedic, it was all fake kind of books that we get nine times out of ten. But I am not writing the series off, I'm still going in with really good expectations and a good feeling about the series. So the 20 Goosebumps Slappy World books that I'm reading in this video are Slappy Birthday to You, Attack of the Jack, I Am Slappy's Evil Twin, Please Do Not Feed the Weirdo, Escape from Shutter Mansion, The Ghost of Slappy, and I do want to give a huge thank you to my friend Katie Carlson for gifting me the first six Goosebumps Slappy World books. I love you so much. It's Alive, It's Alive, The Dummy Meets the Mummy, Revenge of the Invisible Boy, Diary of a Dummy, They Call Me the Night Howler, My Friend Slappy, Monster Blood is Back even though I wish it wasn't, Fifth Grade Zombies, Judy and the Beast, Slappy in Dreamland, Haunting with the Stars, The Special Edition, Slappy Beware, Night of the Squawker, and finally, Fright Night. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's how you say it. These 20 books I will be reading and this vlog will be full of spoilers. I'll go through each of the stories, what I loved about each book, what I hated about each book, and I will be rating every single book out of 10. So at the end of the video, I will be ranking the Goosebumps Sappy World books from worst to best. I will also be giving the Sappy World series an overall average like I did with the first five main Goosebumps series. So I will put those averages on the screen now. And as you can see, the Horrorland to the Most Wanted series have not been doing as good as the first two initial series. But if we can crack an average of at least a 4 out of 10 for the majority of these books, then I will be happy. I just don't want it to continue slipping down. So hopefully Slappy World will redeem the Goosebumps series for me. So let's see if R.L. Stein can do it. I always say I go into these Goosebumps books with a very open mind. In one of my main issues <laughs> that I'm gonna repeat again is that we seem to tread the same exact stories that have been told a million times already by R.L. Stein, And this one is genuinely no different to the majority of the previous Living Dummy books, to the point where certain scenes could literally have been just copied and pasted from those books and just 
transplanted into this one. I will start off with some positives though. I do like the storytelling style of Goosebumps Slappy World. I mean, I, I love and love it. We have Slappy introducing the story and he says the exact same thing every single book at the very start. Welcome to my world. Yes, it's Slappy World. You're only screaming in it. Ha ha ha. He says that line every single book and then he does change up some of the jokes. Well, I mean, sometimes he keeps saying, I give myself goosebumps and things like that. There are just, in one of the future books, I'm going to tell you exactly the jokes that he says that just aren't funny. Like, even for a middle grade audience, I think these jokes or Slappy in general is just skewing far too young. These are jokes that maybe a five-year-old would laugh at, not a nine plus child, you know? It's definitely not going to make an adult laugh, which is fine. I'm not the target audience anymore, but... Even then, I'm still aware of the fact that this humour is just far too young for the audience that Goosebumps is trying to sell itself to. It's become a point now where Slappy is just a joke himself. Slappy isn't even a villain. He's, he tries to be. He tries to be. And believe me, he tries over and over and over again, doing the exact same things over and over and over again. But he's just a joke now. There's nothing remotely scary or funny about Slappy anymore. He needs to be retired, honestly, at this point. And I don't have the best hopes for this series in general, considering a lot of these stories do have Slappy interjected into the plotline. He's not just telling us the story, he is also part of the story every now and then. I do like that we do have an interjection chapter every now and then from Slappy 2, almost like he's given a kind of commentary on what's already happened, and I kind of like that because it does make it a little bit different to previous Goosebumps books, but the bar is low. The bar is pretty low, so I will accept any kind of change that makes it just a little bit more inventive. Before you click out as well, thinking, oh, I'm just gonna be negative the entire video, there are actually two books in the six books that I've read so far that I do like, so all hope is not lost. I also try to count, like, how many fake scares there are in these books, too. I kind of lost count. Where did I... I'm sure there was, like, seven? I think seven fake cliffhanger endings. It's seven too many. In this book, we follow Ian. It is his 12th birthday, and his dad loves to, well, prank him for one, but also he has a doll hospital, which did add some creepy ambience to this, and he ends up getting a ventriloquist dummy for Ian for his birthday. The dummy turns out to be Slappy. And on his birthday as well, his two cousins come to visit, Johnny and Vinny, and oh my gosh, they are like the worst cousins ever. The sister's also annoying, but not as bad once we get introduced to the cousins. They are awful. Literally, we're introduced to them by Ian opening the door, and he gets punched directly in the face by one of the cousins. The cousin says, oh, it was just an accident. I was just knocking on the door and stuff. But like, oh my gosh, they just get worse and worse and worse as this book goes on. It still feels like 90s kids. Like these don't feel like present day kids, which is both good and bad. I just feel like R.R. Stein isn't adapting his characters to the present day. He's given us all of these modern day things and technology that they use and phones and playstations or what have you and even wikipedia which slappy the dummy has a wikipedia entry but he doesn't actually update his characters because they feel the exact same as all of the characters from the original series which yeah, i do love the original series so much and of course i want it to feel like that but if we're just going to rehash all of the plots and stories from the original series then can we just at least update the characters a little bit, give them a bit more variety. And I mean, I would prefer to have these stories being new and original, but obviously that's too much to ask for. But it does feel like the writing style, the character development is all stuck in the 90s as well. There was three chapters in this that was really good. It goes back in time, and I did love like the whole flashback thing, when Ian and his dad go to this doll museum and it's started off the reason why Ian even wanted a dummy for his birthday. And I loved exploring that. I thought, you know, actually, like, this is such a good writing and things like that. It was like so creepy and, and stuff. And turns out that it was all fake. And yeah, his dad introduces him to Dr. Klausman. And there is a receptionist person there as well. Ian's dad disappears and he goes to ask the receptionist where he is. And the receptionist is like, you're not supposed to be in here. Like, we're close to the... And Ian's like, oh, but I was invited by Dr. Klausman. And she's like, there isn't a Dr. Klausman who works here. Like, honestly, all of that was really creepy and it lasted about three chapters. And then, yeah, chapter 11, Mr. Parker slapped Ian on the back. Gotcha! I'm just like, oh my god, the last three chapters were fake. I, oh my god, like, why do some of the creepy things that happen in Goosebumps happen either in dreams, or it was just all a prank? And I, guys, you know this, say it with me. 
I hate pranks. I hate the fake scares that are in Goosebumps. You don't actually get Goosebumps from these books anymore. Ah, uh, he relies too heavily on them, so yeah, I was so sad that the last three chapters had been fake. Just keep it a one chapter if you're gonna try and pull the rug out from under us. He usually does. So I guess he's a little bit inventive there by making the joke last longer. Molly, who is Ian's sister, gets a dog called Abigail and the cousins and Slappy and everyone like do terrorize her because of that. Again, like what I hate about these living dummy books is that there is always some kind of talent show or something that requires the main character to perform with Slappy. Like almost every single Living Dummy book is like, oh, we're gonna prepare for the talent show. There's a talent show coming up at school. We're gonna put Slappy in front of everyone and he's gonna tell these awful, awful jokes, right? So listen to these jokes, right? I'm just like, this is Slappy. This is the mascot for Goosebumps. So yeah, Ian's mom is like telling him, oh, do your act in front of us. And like they're doing the whole talent show. And so these are Slappy's jokes. Someone was unfair to you, Mrs. Barker. Why did they give you a face that could break mirrors? Did you make the dinner tonight, Mrs. Barker? I'm sorry, but I throw better food than that. Good news, Molly. They're looking for someone to play a pig on Animal Planet. You don't have to audition. You've got the part. Molly, here's a riddle. What's the difference between you and a dead rotten bird on the sidewalk? I don't know either. You know what's nice? When you leave a room and it starts to smell better. Uncle Donny, is that really your face or did someone barf all over your shoulders? These are the kinds of jokes. Oh, hang on, it's still, go it's still going on, oh my God. Mr. Barker, I don't want to say you stink, but you give diarrhea a bad name, ha 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 ha. Hey Molly, know how to make yourself prettier? Stick your head in a cuisinart and push start. Johnny and Vinny, you two guys look exactly like something I stepped in at the dog park. These are the kind of jokes, I mean, Usually Sabi goes into fat phobic jokes and I think he might do actually in I Am Sabi's Evil Twin. Like he usually goes into like these really bad, awful, poor jokes that genuinely do not elicit any kind of laughter unless you're five years old. Okay, actually no, there's some fat phobic jokes in here as well when, uh, cause actually the, the two cousins steal Slappy from Ian as a prank and Slappy ends up like terrorizing them and trying to make them his slaves. So they try and get him back to Ian. You two are beneath me. You're a waste of my time. You're so dumb. You both stay up all night studying how to pick your nose. Ugh. Actually, I thought you two saves needed some exercise. It's not good that your stomach comes into a room before you do. Ha ha ha. He's just not funny and he's not scary. So what is Slappy? What is Slappy? He is a joke. He's an absolute joke. So did not love this one. And also the ending too. Like R.L. Stein cannot write endings. So Abigail, who is Molly's doll, she comes to life and she's the one who stops Slappy. But it all happens in like three pages. She comes to life like pretty much out of nowhere. I was loving the moment before this as well because Slappy was making all of the dolls that were in this like doll hospital that Ian's dad has come to life and they were coming towards them. And that is creepy. That is good. But then, yeah, Abigail just suddenly comes to life and she says, stop, stop it now. And then she shouts out the magic words that make Slappy fall asleep. I don't know why the people who get Slappy don't just burn that stupid piece of paper as soon as he gets put back to sleep. Just burn it and then nobody can ever reawaken him because it doesn't say the magic words on his Wikipedia page. Honestly, it's just so ridiculous. There are some better books coming up, don't worry. I'm not gonna be this negative the entire way through. I just, I really despise the living dummy books now. Like to the point where it's getting as bad as the Monster Blood books for repetition and just no genuine scares or even humour. So this one gets a 2.43 out of 10. Just so pitiful, honestly, like a really bad start to a new series. The Most Wanted series started better with Wanted the Haunted Mask. And so we've just like started off really badly. Ugh. This one follows siblings Violet and Sean and they go to Sea Urchin Cove where their uncle Jim lives and oh. I did like this more than the previous book, okay? It's not all doom and gloom of this one, but we do start off with the exact same beginning as books like Dr. Jekyll and Heidi. What was that called again? Jekyll and Heidi? That book when, you know, they come to a new town to visit a relative and a random person comes up to them and they're like, stay away from that place. That person is evil or weird or something like that. We have the exact same start in this one. It's happened a couple of times. I can't remember the other book, but I just remember so vividly it happening in Jekyll and Heidi from Goosebumps series 2000 and I'm pretty positive it happened in Horrorland series and the Most Wanted series as well. So this is the obligatory that person is weird opening that we've had 
a dozen other times. But it does get a little bit better from there. And we do get to Uncle James. There is a weird talking cat. Like it can actually talk. And I do like the folk tale around the fact that somebody was lost at sea. Can't really remember his name. I read all six of these books like pretty much back to back. And yeah, this cat was with them for 300 days I would say. And the person who was I would say taught them how to talk. And I, I don't understand how that can happen. But I'm not going to question it because... You know, it, it is an element of fantasy in there, so I do suspend my disbelief sometimes. Uncle Jim tells them to stay out of the basement. No, he doesn't say that. He says, stay out of this one specific room. You're not allowed in there. You can go anywhere else, but you're not allowed in this specific room. So what do Violet and Sean do? They go into that specific room, and they say these weird boxes, and this is where it's like genuinely creepy, and I really liked it. I was like, oh my god, we're doing something new. And they are like jack in the boxes, and they go through and they do these jack-in-the-boxes, and these weird things kind of pop up and pop out. But they get to one where Captain Jack the Knife comes out. And that whole sequence is very creepy and scary. Just the whole idea of like the pop goes the weasel stuff going on and these weird things popping up. Like that is so genuinely weird and spooky. So I thought, oh, this is going to be so good like throughout. I thought it was going to be really good kind of jack-in-the-box scary adventure thing. It goes in a total different direction and so I didn't like it as much by the end of it. And things just didn't add up too. So say when Jack the Knife pops out, they've been asleep for however many years they've been asleep for, and yet somehow, somehow, he's got the uncle trapped in one of those jack-in-the-boxes. And I'm just like, wait, how in the world did he do that when they literally just woke him up by doing the Pop Goes the Weasel thing? How did he get Uncle Jack in one of those boxes? Because he hasn't left the room, he hasn't left the sight of these kids. Like, how are they, how did he do that? What? You know, like, things like that just genuinely don't make sense. Like, he's trying to hold it over them. Like, you have to go to this specific island to get my canary. Otherwise, I will not let Uncle Jim go. But I'm still like, but how in the world did you get Uncle Jim in the first place? You've been in that freaking box this entire time. You know, like, it just does not make sense. So they do end up boarding Captain Jack the Knife's ship. Captain Jack the Knife stays behind for some reason. And Violet and Sean get on the ship with his crew. And they are an oddball crew. I like the piratey adventure stuff. I like the seafaring stuff. But it just gets really silly. And it doesn't really keep any creepiness to it or anything like that. Yeah, they end up springing a leak. One of them, I think it was Mad Madeline. Like, she turned out to not be mad. And they're trying to get this canary. Okay, like they get to the island, they get a canary, they take it back, and he's like, oh, that's not the canary that I was supposed to have. However, it will do, but I'm going back on my promise. But the ghost of that person who was 300 days at sea, he comes back and he scares Captain Jack the Knife, and that's how the story is resolved. Captain Jack the Knife and his crew go back to being Jack in the Box little things. So I would have loved it if we had have had a bit more of a scarier adventure on the sea, like on this ship. Maybe if Captain Jack the Knife actually came with them. It's a bit like, what was his name? Murder the Clown in the Goosebumps Horror, no, Goosebumps Most Wanted book, A Nightmare on Clown Street. We have this premise of this really creepy villain and they don't do anything to warrant being called a villain or warrant any kind of scares. It's such a missed opportunity. And also I didn't understand when they were getting marooned on an island. So yeah, there was a rival captain called Captain Billy Bottoms, catches the crew and gets them to be marooned on the island, right? So they're like, oh, we're gonna leave you here. So they get the kids and Captain Jack the Knife's crew, they put them on this island and then they run away. Like the kids and the crew run away. And then for some reason, Captain Billy Bottoms and the people on the ship leave the ship to chase after them. I'm just like, why? You're marooning them on this island. You're leaving them there. So why are you running after them? You, they're literally doing what you're asking them to do. They're being marooned on this island. You can just go on your ship and leave. Because that's the whole point of marooning people on an island. But no, instead, the people who tried to maroon them, Captain Billy Bottoms, goes onto the island and chases after them. Why? I do not know, because he doesn't need to catch them. And the kids and Captain Jack the Knife's crew end up going onto Billy Bottom's ship and leaving with his ship. But I don't understand that whole sequence because Captain Billy Bottoms didn't need to go on that island to chase after them. Why would you maroon someone on an island and then go after them on that island? I don't understand it. Like, I feel like none of this was planned or anything. I genuinely feel like a lot of Goosebumps books are just written in the moment. I think I counted four, eight, no, five. Five fake cliffhangers in this one. I'm keeping my whole love for that whole Jack in the Box scene and how creepy I found that to elevate my rating a little bit for this one over the previous book. So this one actually gets a 3.29 out of 10, which actually sounds a lot better than I'm giving it credit for. I do believe that this book started strong and then just walked the plank after that. 
I Am Slappy's Evil Twin is another Slappy book and in this one we get introduced to Slappy's twin brother Snappy and Snappy seems to be a lot nicer than Slappy is. What I really enjoy about this book is that we do actually have a prologue at the very start. It's set during 1920. We have a man who is making these dolls and we actually see Mr. Wood and Mr. Wood was the original ventriloquist dummy from Night of the Living Dummy and I love that callback. I felt a little bit like, you know, wanted the haunted mask where we had that prologue at the start there and I was like, you know what? This is actually like really good and I, I was enjoying my time there. Even though there is a big, you know, glaring plot hole in that too, in character motivations do not make sense because this man who was making the dummy, he seemed like such a nice person and he actually had to move because he was like, I need to get away from like all this evil and all this negativity and stuff. And then he turns out to be an evil person by the end of the prologue chapter, which meant like, well, why did he move? Like, why did he have this whole spiel about moving and, and stuff like that? But I digress. Like, I'm trying not to use my critical brain too much with these Goosebumps books because R.R. Stein really is asking me to turn that off. But we actually get introduced to Luke and Kelly. They are brother and sister. And then they also have their best friend, Jamal, who comes and hangs out with them a lot. Luke and Kelly's dad work in horror movies. And so there are like props and things at the house. And the dad ends up bringing Slappy and Snappy to the house. And then honestly, it's as soon as we get Slappy and Snappy, that's when the book becomes terrible. But the characters themselves make the worst decisions and they were like, it's actually infuriating how dumb they are. It makes such a mess and terrorize them for a little bit at the very start. And then they are locked in their glass cases. And then we have the kids going, oh, how can we prove to dad that they're alive? Oh, hang on, I know, let's let them out of this glass case and record them doing something. Even though they're tapping on the glass case, why don't they just record that without letting them out? I don't know. They don't explain why they didn't just do that. However, they do let them out. Obviously, they wreak havoc. And I don't understand how Slappy and Snappy can pick up a 12-year-old boy and lock him in a glass case. Like, I know they have some kind of strength in order to allow them to overwhelm people. But again, they're just two wooden dolls and somehow they can pick up this boy while he's kicking and screaming and doing all of this that, and the other and lock him in a glass case. These two little dummies, they can do that. Like, honestly, that did not make sense. But I was, again, trying to overlook it as much as possible because I do know they're supposed to have more strength than usual. But yeah, even when they're trying to record all of the things that happen, every single time the characters have done something too dumb that, oh, I, I forgot to press record or oh, it wasn't actually on them the whole time. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, why are these characters so dumb? Honestly, it's just bad decision after bad decision. And the whole repeated formula of them trying to tell their dad about these dummies while they're creating havoc and the dad not believing them because who would actually believe them? They do sound crazy, which is exactly the point. And something I do like about the Living Dummy books is that they really do manipulate and make the main character feel crazy by what's going on and isolates them to a point where that can be sinister. But again, we have a tired mascot who is not funny or creepy in the slightest anymore. And they just end up repeating themselves time after time after time again. Luke, did you forget to press the record button? She was right, I never pressed it. So the dad as well has this really important movie person coming to visit and you know, he's an old friend and yeah, he's just an important person. So Sappy's like, put on this headpiece and say everything that I'm about to tell you to this person. Otherwise we will make trouble for you and your dad. I mean, for one, they're already making trouble for them and their dad, like nothing's different. Two, this is a really important person. So Slappy making him say these things, it's, like, it's not a good deal at all. It doesn't make any sense for him to do that. They're so worried about them ruining this meeting with the important movie person, with the dad. And so they decide to ruin it. And that's how they're gonna protect him. I promise no one will get hurt. Your father's guest, Mr. Benedict, has arrived. Luke, you go in and say hello to him, then repeat everything I say, everything you understand. He's got no bargaining power here because they can just go, well, no, and just lock them in the room and leave. Like, honestly, there's so many things that they could do that they just don't do. Luke did not have to go into that room and say, like, not even funny things. Mr. Benedict, is that a huge ugly wart on your shoulders or is that your head? Is that your nose or are you eating a cucumber? Dad says your nickname is Walrus, but is that true? Dad says your IQ is the same as your belt size. I'm just like, just stop. Like you don't actually have to say any of this and you can both walk away scot-free. Because even after all this stuff, he's like, how oh, well I lied. I'm a dirty liar. Like, of course, like 
there was just no sense of doing that. But then the most infuriating and nonsensical thing that happened happened more towards the end. It was like the whole conflict thing. These kids believe that when Slappy and Snappy go to the movie set with the dad, that they take a propane tank. We knew that they brought the propane tank and hidden it somewhere. They expect two of these dummies to... Have you seen a propane tank? Have you? Do you know how heavy they are? Do you know how hard it is for two dummies to hide that when the father has taken them to a movie set? How were they even supposed to get it into the actual movie set when the father takes them out of the car? It doesn't make any sense. Of course they didn't take the propane tank because it does turn out that the dad took the propane tank. Obviously the dummies didn't do it, but they think, oh, they've taken the propane tank. They're going to blow up the studio. So we have to go down to the studio and save everyone, make everything that much more worse. And then realize through the admission of the dad that the dad took the propane tank because he thought it was too dangerous to have near the house. I'm just like, wait, do they even know how propane tanks work? Because we get to the end as well. Apparently there is another one in the garden which, you know, if his dad thought that they were too dangerous to have in the house, why didn't he take the one out of the garden for one? Slappy and Snappy end up fighting each other in the garden at the end and smack the side of the propane tank and it blows up. That's not how they work. And it's a dummy, two dummies fighting. How is that tiny little tap against it gonna blow up a propane tank? I was left baffled and bewildered by the whole thing. It was honestly so stupid. This whole thing was stupid. And I thought, oh, it's gonna be a little bit different because we do have a twin. Oh, wait, hang on, actually. I actually wrote her because it says the propane tank, that's where it is, behind the garage. But the dad admitted to taking the propane tank to the movie set. So is this the same propane tank? It can't be the same propane tank because the dad took it away. So it's a different tank. And they're just like, oh, that, that's where it is. No, it's not. They know it's at the movie set. I'm just, this wasn't written well. This was not written well at all. Oh, I will say as well though, because I don't want to leave this all negatively. The dad sees them fighting because he followed them home, sees them fighting and he believes his children. And then Kelly tells him, but you said the dummies are valuable. Dad raised the dummy in front of him. I don't care. They're not as valuable as believing in my kids. I love that message. That is a really good message. I wish we focused more on developing the dad and the kids more. They also stop the dad from burning who they think is the good twin. But actually, it turns out that the good twin is evil all along, too. It's just like, again, it was a really crappy twist ending. Didn't love it. One of my least favorite Goosebumps books ever with a 1.86. Just shockingly bad. And before I move on to the next one, can we just say as well that the twist ending of Snappy being evil? We have in the title here, I am Snappy's evil twin. So the whole plot twist at the end was revealed in the title all along. Like, it, it wasn't a twist. It was just bad. But not as bad as Please Do Not Feed the Weirdo. It does get better after this, I promise. The next two after this are better. This one, I think, is the low point of the series so far for me. This one has a 1.29 out of 10. It was so boring. The premise was awful. I don't understand why this became a book. It just... Why? And somehow the characters in this one were dumber than the ones in I Am Slappy's Evil Twin. In this one we have Jordan and Carla, they go to this carnival with their parents, they split off from their parents, they see this boy in a cage called Robbie, and a sign saying please do not feed the weirdo. The person in the cage, Robbie, is the son of Mr. Ferber, who I believe owns the carnival. He has this cage, he knows exactly what happens when you feed the weirdo, but he has this cage out in public, and he doesn't want anyone to feed the weirdo. Why don't you just put him away then? Put him in a room, lock him in a room, you don't need him out in public. <laughs> I'm, I'm being so petty now. But yeah, Jordan and Carla, they do end up giving Robbie some food because he's like, I'm so hungry, please, I need something to eat. So they give him some food. He turns into a monster, escapes his cage, and then they're like, oh, damn, we shouldn't have fed the weirdo. Okay, so they get home. The whole monster thing made people go home early. Like, people saw the monster and screamed. So, like, this monster is genuinely known to be a, a real thing. So it's not like Jordan and Carla have to convince anyone that there is a monster. So one thing I did like about this book is that the parents do actually believe the whole monster angle from pretty much the beginning. So I do like that. So, yeah, they end up going home. Jordan then gets a visit from Robbie. He knocks on the window and he's like, oh, gosh, I'm so hungry. Like... I promise I won't become a monster again if you feed me. <laughs> so Jordan's like, okay, let's go downstairs in the kitchen and I'll give you some food. 
He turns into a monster, goes on a rage and rampage, leaves. And yeah, John's like, oh damn, he tricked me again. They do that again and again and again. I'm just like, well, you learn your lesson. Don't feed the weirdo. But that's essentially all this story is. Like, and Robbie can turn into anyone. He can look like anyone. So you kind of don't know who he's going to be next. In a way, I kind of like the questioning of, hmm, is he the teacher? Is he the new boy who has just started? You know, I kind of like the paranoia that came from that. But that is essentially all the story is, is feeding this person and he becomes a monster. He runs away. You don't actually get to see him do anything too monstrous. He just makes a mess and leaves. I'm like, okay, what's the point of this story? There genuinely isn't one. By the end of it as well, they try to trick Robbie by coming to this like school party at a, at a picnic thing where there's gonna be loads of food, except he never comes. And Jordan, the main character, is the one who ends up getting caught and they think he is Robbie in disguise. So that's how we end the book. I kind of like that ending. It's still not amazing and just genuinely so boring. Oh, there was one moment when it looked like they were gonna get him food, but Carla sneakily went to her parents to be like, okay, the monster's actually here. That was good smart thinking on Carla's part. Probably the only time a character was smart in this book. Even the parents as well, because when Jordan feeds him in the kitchen the second time they give him food, the mom's like, quick, call the police, call 911. And dad said, are you crazy? What are you going to tell the police? That a boy turned into a monster and got sick in our kitchen? Do you honestly think anyone would believe that story? I mean, considering the carnival was pretty much shut down because of a monster, uh, yeah, they would believe it. Considering that's where you literally just came from. So even the parents are dumb in this. Even though the parents were on our side, they didn't disbelieve the main characters, which is such a nice change. I'm like, wow, wow. So yeah, 1.29 for this one. Definitely one of my least favorite Goosebumps books. So forgettable, so boring. Okay, let's get into some more positivity here because Escape from Shutter Mansion, I really did quite enjoy. Of course, not perfect, but I am allowing myself to enjoy it a little bit more, at least like take the story of face value. We follow Riley and in his town there is Shudder Mansion and there's actually a really popular video game that's based off Shudder Mansion and it has ghosts and monsters inside it and stuff and I really like the idea of that. I wasn't too sure where the story was going to go because I wasn't sure if he was going to be trapped in the mansion and he had to go through the levels of this video game or something and realize that the video game was real or I don't know like how it was going to go so kind of like that this wasn't too predictable. However I don't enjoy how we did end up going to the mansion because, and I don't think this is allowed, they go to school and the teacher says I need everyone for their assignment to essentially find an adventure or something like that. And she says to Riley, our main character, who talks about Shadow Mansion, oh, you should stay the night there in this abandoned mansion for your assignment overnight. I mean, for one, bedtime. Two, isn't that dangerous? Three, is that not trespassing on a like property? You know what I mean? It's like, is this teacher serious? right now. I mean, I know the teacher ends up saying, oh, you can take five friends and the parents will also come along as well. Like your parents will be there with you. But also like, you can't decide that for anyone. These parents have jobs, surely. These parents have jobs. You can't tell them to, oh, for the kids assignment, you all have to stay overnight in an abandoned mansion. Where's the permit? Where's the permission? That was really confusing to me. I mean, it does make more sense that they would go to the mansion with their parents and yeah, that makes it more safe. Still doesn't make it completely safe because again, it's an abandoned mansion. You just don't know what's gonna happen in there. But I'm like, how could a teacher assign that kind of assignment? However, I digress. I didn't use it as a detriment to the story because we do still need a story. I do think there were better ways of getting these kids to this mansion without this stupid teacher assignment thing that would not ever be a real thing. But anyway, yeah, they get to the mansion. Creepy things happen. So I do kind of like how scary it becomes because yeah, the parents are downstairs and they do try and play this prank where they leave screaming or something. But then it does turn out that the house is pretty much kind of alive and there are things that are alive in the walls and they do scare them. And it's not part of a prank. The parents just wanted to prank them for that one bit. But this is a genuinely scare, well, scary kind of experience for these kids. There is an actual beast. And I liked how it tied into the video game because Riley could never defeat this beast in the video game. So he has to try and defeat it in real life. Even though he defeats it really easily by smashing a gold cup over its head, it still made it quite a good story because the end turns out to be some kind of like time loop thing. So they're gonna constantly be going to this mansion over and over and over again because he ends up pressing a reset button after like defeating this beast. Instead of resetting everything and they escape, 
it just makes them go back to the beginning and it's going to keep doing that and doing that and doing that probably forever. So I really do like that because that is really messed up. Probably one of the few Goosebumps endings that I kind of like. But no, I will give this one some credit for at least entertaining me. And that's why this book gets a 5.14, which honestly to me, is quite high. But no, I like the atmosphere, the characters were infuriating like the previous ones, and yeah, it was overall a good time. Say I can be positive. And the course of Sabi as well. I kind of liked also. I was really worried because I thought, oh great, another story with Slappy actually in it. He's not just telling the story. He's not just interjecting himself, you know, giving us a commentary every now and then. He's actually in the story as well. But this one changed the living dummy formula and I really appreciate that. So that's why I'm giving this one a 5.00 out of 10. Hey, I will give credit where credit is due. This was a little bit different. <laughs> there is an element of intrigue in this as well because we follow someone called Shep and at the start of the story, she tells us that there is a, a ghost, I think called Annalie, in the basement and nobody can see this ghost but her and it's something that is kind of well it kind of comes back at the end so i kind of like the full circle moment but shep and her class along with mr hansen go on this sort of camping trip and mr hansen brings uh, slappy the dummy and slappy ends up overtaking the bus driver and drives this bus which they do end up stopping him but it means everyone saw slappy do that including the teacher and the teacher's like oh my god like this thing you know is actually real and he knew it was real as well like he said something about it coming to life and it being creepy and he still brought it on this school trip with these kids and put them in danger essentially but they have this camping trip and the teacher does put Slappy to sleep with the magic words so it should all be fine and Shep also has an enemy who when they go back to the normal place where they live the enemy of Shep had put Slappy in her her bag so she ends up bringing it home with her. So firstly I love that we started off with the camping setting and it was only a few chapters and then we're back to reality in a way. I really enjoyed that. I thought oh that's like actually quite a good you know change of pace for a book. So yeah Slappy does come to life and Shep accidentally kills Slappy. I I say kills very loosely because even though he does get a crack in the back of his head and his ghost his spirit does come back in haunts Shep, which is something new. It's something new. I was like, oh my God, that, that's actually brilliant. Yeah, I love the fact that the ghost of Slappy is haunting her and not just Slappy himself just being awful and unfunny, you know? I love that change so much. And the stuff that ghost Slappy actually does in this is a lot more dangerous and scary than anything he's ever done before. So for example, he ends up scaring the horse that Shep is on. And obviously like a horse that's scared is thrashing around like that's really dangerous someone could get killed so i love that we actually had a scary fall in slappy and i was like oh my god are we redeeming slappy a little bit in this are we so i mean I, I think the end does let this down again like i i want to give it a higher rating but i just it needs to be great all the way through for it to get that but i do think it was let down by the ending so slappy does come back to life which i didn't love it was like he was dead, like he's supposed to be dead. Like how can you just resurrect Slappy by just fixing him? So he ends up coming back to life, but then the ghost, the ghost of Annalie comes and Annalie's like, I need to do one good deed to move on. So I kind of liked how we tied in the ghost of Annalie at the start to now, so we didn't just come out of nowhere, you know? Even though like we hadn't seen Annalie for so long that it kind of does still feel a little bit out of left field. But still, it, it makes sense in a way. But then Annalie's like, yeah, I need to do one good deed and so Shep's like, okay, save me, save me, and that's your good deed. And Ali's like, no, I'm gonna do a good deed for Slappy. So she rips up the magic paper with the words on it to, you know, put Slappy back to sleep. And that's her good deed. So she leaves Shep and Slappy, and Slappy's like, well, 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 where were we? So we have a like, cliffhanger ending. It's not a terrible ending. It's 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 an okay ending, but I don't understand because Annalie, what she does is evil. You know, she's letting an evil dummy terrorize an innocent person. So it's not a good deed. Like she's doing a good deed for an evil person. It's not a good deed. You know, it's a bad deed. Ghost thing because they have unfinished business. I can't leave till I do a good deed. I led a very selfish life. I owe one good deed. One good deed and I can happily go to the beyond. You didn't do a good deed there. <laughs> A good deed for Slappy, but Slappy is evil. So it's not a good deed. Anyway, yeah, I liked how we changed the formula a little bit with this one. Probably my favourite Living Dummy book since the... Was it Son of Slappy in the Most Wanted series? I like that one a bit more than this one. But yeah, kind of restore my faith a little bit in Slappy. So that's good. 
Okay, please don't judge the fact that I'm wearing this hoodie two days in a row, okay? It's just way too comfortable and I don't want to change it. So I think I found maybe the best Goosebumps book since Creep from the Deep from the Horrorland series. It's actually up there. I really enjoyed this. I had to look it up to see if Oral Stein got any Ghost Riders. Because I was like, what is this? Like, there's been quite a few good books already in the in this series. What? Is this like a, a turning point for the Goosebumps books? Like, what is going on? But I really liked it. In fact, it had a good ending as well. It had a good story throughout. It was actually kind of creepy at times. It wasn't infuriating. I liked it. This one follows Livy and her friend Gates and they are part of a robotics team and there is some kind of competition at school. And Livy's parents are programmers so they are really good with robotics and things like that. So uh, Livy, she and her friend have made this robot called Francine who I imagine looks like that. I'm just like how in the world did these two 12 year olds make this this thing? But I'm not even thinking about that because I am just trying to enjoy these books for what they are and enjoy I did. But this robot seems to not want to do anything that these kids are telling them. Nothing that she's been programmed to do, she will do. She's called Francine. And at the end of chapter three, Francine ends up hurting uh, another boy. And it looks like this robot can get quite violent. And that is a scary thing. That's rather terrifying. And I thought maybe, oh, we'll probably end up downplaying this and it's gonna turn out to not be that scary or whatever. It's gonna be one big prank. But no, actually, the end of this book, I'm gonna jump all over the place for this one, but the end, the very end of this book, when the main plot is all said and done, they enter Francine into that competition and Francine ends up like locking the doors and telling everyone that they're trapped now and they have to do what she says or they'll get hurt. And it's like, okay, this is like a robot takeover. This is terrifying. What I enjoy most about this book though is that we don't really know what's going on for half the time and I was again thinking there was just gonna be one big prank but Livy and Gates they're so unsure about what's happening with the robot so they give the robot to Livy's parents to have a look at but they end up sneaking into the basement where they're not allowed to go and they end up saying the the dad with wires coming out of the back of his head or the back of his neck and Livy's like oh my god are my parents robots like what's going on? Turns out that Mrs. B, who is like the housekeeper person, she is the one who was the actual robot all along. And I was like, what? Livy's parents actually made Mrs. B, but Mrs. B got too intelligent and took over and made like clones or like duplicate robots of the parents. It, it was a little bit of a mess in terms of like who was doing that and who was actually what, but it actually worked. I was honestly so flabbergasted by this one. It's one of those ones where the twist didn't ruin the book or like the ending didn't ruin the book. In fact, I would love to see a sequel where we see Francine, I don't know, wreak havoc, take over the world or something. I've never said that about Goosebumps book in so long because I know how sequels go. They outstay their welcome half the time. Just look at Slappy, for instance. I genuinely would love to see more of this. Just the idea that you can make something and it can go out of control in a way that could hurt other people. Yeah, it's a terrifying concept and executed really well. So honestly, pat on the back R.L. Stein or whichever ghostwriter wrote it. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. And we continue the trend by having a fourth book in a row that I enjoy. Again, I really like this one. I gave this one a 5.57 out of 10. It's kind of warranted. I was a little bit worried about it because it does incorporate Slappy quite a lot again. Although saying that though, he does take a little bit more of a I guess a co-starring role along with a mummy in I Love Egypt or just things to do with Egyptian mythology. And we do start the book off in Cairo actually. And we have a few chapters there and then we go to, where is it? Like some place in America. And it's a story kind of set in three parts that they kind of all intersect a little bit. So in part one, we are introduced to a mummy with a curse, a little bit like the curse of the mummy's tomb. There is a mummy called Aragotus and if his tomb is disturbed, then he will awaken. And there are these magic words that you have to say out loud for him to be awakened, exactly like Slappy, but like different magic words, but still similar. And then we go to present day part one, and we have a boy called Aaron. His school has been visited by this puppeteer person. And for some reason, this puppeteer gives Aaron this dummy who turns out to be Slappy. And what I love about this is that Slappy just comes to life in front of everyone 
including his parents. So there's no kind of trying to make the child seem like they're being crazy for saying, oh my God, this dummy's alive, you know, like in pretty much nearly every other living dummy book. You actually see the parents say it themselves and be like, oh my God. Slappy does say like the worst repetitive jokes ever, every single time. Things like, not as horrible as that big wart on your neck or is that your head? There are so many that's exactly like that. So many jokes that are exactly like that. So I would love it if like Sappy just didn't talk in the books that he's in. I would love that. But I did love the fact that the mum and the dad are there and they say everything. I do think Sappy as well, when he's being sick on everyone, the things he does is just gross. And again, I think potty humour, humour that I think will only make a five-year-old laugh, not the actual intended target audience of a Goosebumps book. Like, Slappy really does dumb it down, like, so much, unfortunately. But I did love the change that the parents in this see Slappy come to life and don't question their kids about it. So the dad actually takes Slappy away and drops him off at a museum. And that's why we get into part three. So we have Kathy, her dad actually runs the museum. And because Aaron's dad left Slappy in front of the museum doors, Kathy's dad brings Slappy inside and makes him part of an exhibit. And honestly, it just leads to like this whole mess of a story, but like it's kind of funny in a way too, like kind of comical, that we have like the mummy who is at this museum, we have Slappy who is now at this museum, and there are two sets of magic words to bring either of them to life or to make them fall asleep. But there is so much confusion over which magic words do what to who, that we constantly have this back and forth between the mummy waking up and Slappy going to sleep, or Slappy waking up and the mummy going to sleep. It was kind of funny, I will give it that. Like. This was probably a more comical Goosebumps book that I've read in such a long time. One that I didn't laugh out loud, but I could appreciate that it was actually doing what it was supposed to do comedy-wise. That wasn't like gross out humour or potty humour. It was actually situational humour. One thing I don't really love is that whenever Slappy is part of a story too, it's always another monster that ends up fighting Slappy. And that's kind of how the conflict happens towards the end of the book. I've noticed this that nearly every single living dummy book, there's a, just a fight between Slappy and someone else. Like in I Am Slappy's Evil Twin, his twin is the one who ends up fighting Slappy. And in this one, the mummy and the dummy, they fight. So that didn't really do anything for me, like that whole sequence. Because I was like, okay, we're doing another fight that the kids aren't really part of. Like they're not really doing anything to contribute to the resolution of this story. Okay. So that did let it down just a little bit for me. But again, I'm like trying to be a lot more lenient towards these Goosebumps books. Because you know, I've just been battered and bruised by so many of them. We have hit the laws of the laws. And whenever something comes along like this, that is, you know, it looks good it sounds good, it feels good, then it's good in my eyes, despite a lot of the flaws. So I do appreciate this for what it is. Unfortunately, the streak of good books had to end. Revenge of the Invisible Boy is essentially one of my least favorite kinds of Goosebumps books in that it deals with pranks and fake scares. And that's like the whole premise of the book. We have Frankie, Melody and Eduardo. They have this kind of magic club. And there is another guy who's part of the club called Ari. And he always messes things up. And it does look like he does it on purpose. In fact, he actually got on my nerves so many times that I was, <laughs> I got a little bit like, okay, actually, yeah, pull pranks on him. I don't care. Like he's, he's not a great guy, but I still don't like when a whole story is revolved around that. So Frankie and his friends do go to see like this magic show. Ori tries to ruin it by saying, oh, that's fake, that's fake, I, you can see him doing this and stuff like that. But Frankie goes backstage, sees the magician who can turn invisible. It reminds me a little bit of Bad Hair Day, I think it was. And I'm sure there are other magician type books where the main character meets the magician. But yeah, he meets the magician and the magician has this potion that turns him invisible. So Frankie ends up stealing some of it. He tries to put it in Ari's drink, but turns out that Frankie drinks it instead. So Frankie becomes invisible. And then he just decides to pull pranks and just be a little terror, essentially. I didn't find it entertaining because I just don't like revenge stuff like that. It's a Revenge R Us as well from series 2000. I just don't like it. I also, when they're seeing the magic show as well, this magician is underwater for like 35 minutes doing nothing and everyone's enthralled. I'm like, come on, that's like the most boring magic show I've ever heard of. Don't care if he's breaking a record. I don't want to sit there for like 35 minutes watching someone just underwater. Sorry, that was just like really petty of me. But like, genuinely, this did nothing for me. I gave it a 2.29 in Coal Pile. I was a little bit sad because we just had four books back to back that I enjoyed to then get a 
really silly revenge story. I just, I didn't love it. But it does get a little bit better with this next one, Diary of a Dummy, book number 10. This one got a cold power rating of 4.00 out of 10. I, again, appreciate that it made the living dummy books just that little bit different, even though I didn't fully love everything that happened in it. But I like the characterization of the main character, Billy, and like him and his family have lost his mum, so him and his dad have had to move to a different house and his sister. And Billy and Maggie, I do like his protagonists. I think they're really good. And the dad works as like a sort of dumpster truck person, and Billy and Maggie end up coming along. They find this suitcase that has Slappy inside it, and they bring it to life. There is a diary too. The dad's there for him coming to life, so again, like we have another story where the parents sees it, and I'm so glad because again, I'm sick of parents not believing the children when this happens, but at the same time, I kind of understand why they don't believe the children, because it is a bit ridiculous. But essentially, Billy and Maggie say in Slappy's diary that there is something called the gold and they try and pursue that, they try and find it because they do live in poverty, like they don't have the best meals and stuff. And I really felt for these kids. I thought, you know, they have honorable intentions and they really wanna find this goal to see if they can help their dad, which is just so, it's so nice. They do end up finding another diary, which brings them to this house that's abandoned. The gold refers to Goldie, who is another dummy. Oh, sorry, I, I circled this. It mentions The Sims 5. I'm just like, we still don't even have that yet. Do we? Do we have a Sims 5 yet? Anyway, they, yeah, they go to this um, house. Before they meet Goldie, actually, there was a really weird moment with the gardener. He was like, can I show you my garden? Are you ready to say the garden? And that was creepy. That was really creepy. If you go into a, a random abandoned house and there is a man there, an older man saying he's the gardener, do you want to come say my garden? Big no no. Big no no. That's scary. That's terrifying. They go in and yeah, Goldie's there. And there's like, again, another battle between Goldie and Slappy which again, like happened in the dummy versus the mummy and I am Slappy's evil twin or whatever. And yeah, so they're going back and forth. Slappy wants Goldie's powers and the kids are just relegated to just watching, which I don't love, but I do like the ending of this one. I think this one has another good ending. This one has um, Slappy defeating Goldie, getting her powers, but also the fact that Slappy is now able to make servants. And we changed slave to servant. Now Slappy says you're gonna be my servant, not slave, so. Thank God they changed that. But at the end, the kids are made into sappy servants. And they're like, shall I open the door for you, sir? Shall I carry that for you, sir? Like, he actually managed to make people his servants at the end of this. And I'm just like, okay, that's pretty good. That's a really good ending. I've been waiting so long for that to kind of happen. He's been saying about it for like 20 living dummy books. And it's kind of good that we finally get that. Even though I'm not on Slappy's side, he's an evil person. Don't get me wrong. Well, evil, more mischievous. He even says in his diary, I'm not an evil person. I'm just mischievous. I'm just like, yeah, I kind of agree with that. Because he only ever makes trouble, like petty trouble, throws up, tells terrible jokes. He's not actually evil, evil. But now that he's actually made children servants, then he is getting in that territory. He's actually getting a little bit scary, which is great, finally. I feel like we're probably gonna ruin this like pretty soon. I don't think we're gonna keep up this momento. I think we followed too much of trying to find the diary more so than anything actually scary or interesting going on. But no, I, I'm, I'm really glad with the direction of some of these books and another good ending for one too. It, it took me by surprise. It's 2 p.m. and it's so dark because there is a storm happening in the UK, which is honestly the best time to read Goosebumps books, even though the storm and everything's scarier than anything I'm reading right now. But still, I appreciate the ambience. They Call Me the Night Howler is another one of those superhero comic book type Goosebumps books. And again, I'm not really a fan of these kinds of books, a bit like the books that are just all pranks and things like the Invisible Boy one. I'm not a fan of those kinds of books, so unfortunately I didn't really love this one. I ended up giving this one a 2.00 out of 10. Was it this book that R.L. Stein said is like his best written book that he's done in years? I beg to differ. <laughs> I just don't like the Doctor Maniac character, and even though the Doctor Maniac character really only appears towards the end, there is another one towards the start of this book who turns out to be an actor in disguise. I just don't like that kind of sub-series that's in it. I think this is like the third book featuring Dr. Maniac, and I just don't like that series. It, it, it needs to stop. Page 12, as soon as we saw Dr. Maniac, Dr. Maniac, I'm not crazy, I'm a maniac. Oh my god, I rolled my eyes so hard. I just hate his stick. I hate everything about it, honestly. I just still trying to read the rest of this with an open mind. Yeah, I just, I don't like 
superhero Goosebumps books. And we have a main character called Mason. He's obsessed with comic books. He ends up meeting someone called the Night Howler who is a superhero, but the Night Howler is retiring. So for some reason, and this is like so irresponsible, this Night Howler decides, oh, I'm gonna let you be the Night Howler. I'm retiring. I'm gonna let you be me from now on kind of thing. And I just find that, yeah, like so irresponsible. Could you imagine in a Marvel movie if like Spider-Man just quit and you just met the first person on the street and said, oh, look, I'm Spider-Man, I'm gonna give you the Spider-Man costume and you're gonna have superpowers. Like, can you imagine just randomly doing that? I know this is a kid's book and it's like feeding into that imagination of, oh, this could happen to anyone. I just still don't believe that that's something that would ever happen. It's why I don't like the superhero books in Goosebumps. They just never make any sense. And of course, superheroes don't make sense anyway because it's fantasy. But even when it's set in reality and the characters are supposed to be real, like the main characters are supposed to be real, they still do things that just don't make any sense too. I mean, it kind of felt like previous superhero Goosebumps books. We have a main character who begins to fight as the Night Owler. We have some really poor fighting scenes. The first one we fight is the Quitter. And Mason ends up winning the fight because the quitter just quits. Like, that's what he does. He just quits. In okay, I can see the humour behind that a little bit. But then we do have a couple more of these fights and it just doesn't do anything for me. It reminds me a little bit of the Are You Afraid of the Dark book that I read last month. I think it was called The Tale of the Three Wishes or something like that. It was one of those books. It was a superhero book in the Are You Afraid of the Dark series, which I like better than this one or any of the superhero books that have happened in Goosebumps. But I think maybe if you do enjoy the superhero books of Goosebumps, you probably will end up enjoying this more than I did. I did kind of like the ending. We end up running into Dr. Maniac and Dr. Maniac is like, oh, do you want to be Dr. Maniac from now on to the main character? And the main character is like, I'm not a kid, I'm a maniac. And it's like he's saying, yes, I'm going to be a villain. <laughs> Just explain it doesn't really sound that interesting or that good. But actually, it was probably one of the highlights of the book was the ending. And probably one of the highlights of any of the Dr. Maniac books. Even though it's probably my least favourite of the Dr. Maniac series. Just not interested in this kind of thing. I hope this is the last ever superhero Goosebumps book we ever have. Okay, my friend Slappy, I'm just reviewing my ratings for the previous Slappy books. And this, I definitely think was better than Slappy Birthday to You in I Am Slappy's Evil Twin. However, I don't think it's as good as The Ghost of Slappy or The Dummy Meets the Mummy or even Diary of a Dummy. So this is like the fourth best <laughs> Slappy book in this series so far. And I gave it a rating of 2.86. I am overall just fed up with Slappy himself, but I know that's a me issue considering this is the Slappy World book series that we're in right now. So it's kind of a given that he would be a more prominent person in the series. But I will give this book credit for, again, changing it up a little bit, like the Dummy Meets the Mummy and the Diary book. The past three Slappy books have tried something a little bit different. It is still such a huge eye roll moment whenever a character reads the magic words out loud. That does not have any kind of impact anymore. In fact, it's become so overdone. It's rather embarrassing that Oral Stein is still trying to pass that off as a scary moment when it's literally happened 20 times in the series before. But we actually follow Barton who is bullied quite a lot. And when he does get Slappy, the dummy, they end up working together to get back at the bullies. So Slappy does actually end up becoming a friend to the main character. I found that a little bit of a, an odd thing for Slappy to do. However, it was kind of fitting in with his agenda of being a little shit. So it makes sense. And I do like that we change it up a little bit. And I felt bad for Barton as well, being like so heavily bullied and the idea of him wanting to get back. And again, I hate revenge plots so much in revenge books in Goosebumps that revolve around that. But I do think Barton was developed a little bit better than previous characters who just want revenge. So I didn't mind it as much in this. It's still a low rating, like 2.86 is not anything to write home about. But I still appreciate the main character to a certain extent and I did like the relationship between Slappy and Barton. Things do go out of control a little bit. Slappy wants Barton to be his only friend and so Slappy tries to terrorise Barton's actual friend Lizzie. So like things do go out of control and he has to try and stop Slappy by the end of it. So I like that we had a little bit of a different dynamic but still wasn't enough to like really save the book. And the ending of this book was just so bad that I lowered the rating again. It essentially Barton passes a dog, a dog that we saw a bit earlier in the book and the dog talks and says, hey Barty, don't you want to be my friend? And I'm pretty sure that's happened a dozen times before where a random animal out of nowhere speaks as the sort of cliffhanger. Actually, I definitely remember it at the end of Revenge of the Lone Gnomes. Yeah, from Goosebumps Most Wanted. 
I remember the end of that book also had a talking dog at the very end. Was it a dog? I, I think it was a dog. It's random. It, it's unnecessary. It was a stupid twist and stupid ending to this book and it ruined the enjoyment for the rest of it too. I have enjoyed some of the endings for these books. I do think Oral Stein overall cannot write a good ending, but sometimes he does nail it and it's rare and it's beautiful when he does that, but this book is not the one with a good ending. And so guys, we have found my least favorite Goosebumps book ever. I'm so sad because we had such a string of good Goosebumps Happy Will books and we've literally just come crashing back down to earth. Monster Blood is back. I hate the Monster Blood books so much. They are like the worst of Goosebumps. They are the worst that Goosebumps has to offer. In no way, shape or form are the Monster Blood books scary, witty, funny. I genuinely, genuinely hate this book. There have been more books that have been, you know, slightly more problematic. There's nothing problematic about this book. I just genuinely hate it. The ending, I mean, I'm just gonna go straight at the ending. Turns out at the very end that it was all a dream. It literally pulls that cliche and that awful, awful ending. The only time I've ever liked it was all a dream kind of ending is The Wizard of Oz. If any other kind of book, movie or anything tries to do the it was all a dream all along kind of angle, it's automatically one of the worst things I've ever read or watched. This had such a an interesting premise to begin with. I thought, okay, if I have to sit through another Monster Blood book again, hopefully it does something a little bit different. And I did like the initial premise. We have Sasha and Nicole. They are entering a sort of baking competition. And I thought, oh, maybe this will be like really interesting because what if they like accidentally put like Monster Blood in their ingredients or something and it, it does something to the judges or the people on the show. And it could have been a bit terrifying to imagine that, but we go in a total, opposite direction to that and it doesn't even utilize the whole cooking aspect of it I think the way it should have. This could have been a demonic Great British Bake Off kind of book. Yes they do end up putting some Monster Blood in their competitors food as a sort of payback thing but before that they are just kicked off the show anyway for like not having made good food but it looks like their competitors had sabotaged them so we have this convoluted sequence of some other competitors getting sick and they get put back onto the show. And yeah, they put the Monster Blood in their competitor's food as a sort of way of like getting back at them. And yeah, we end up having like the judges get bigger and other people just get bigger. And that's pretty much about it. Like this happens in every single Monster Blood book. People eat it or have contact with Monster Blood and they just get bigger. And then we have like the easiest resolution at the end there because what they end up doing is just stomping on the Monster Blood and that's what gets rid of it. There was a little bit of a tense moment where it looked like the Monster Blood was like swallowing people up, which honestly, like that would have been interesting. That would have been fun. That would have been a little bit scary, but because of how easy it is to defeat Monster Blood by just like standing on it, or it like expires out of nowhere, it's so pitiful. But the cardinal sin for this book was the fact that it was all a dream all along. You know, like, ah, oh God, I, I hate that. I mean, Slappy in the epilogue does say, hey, was it a dream or not? If it was a dream, why is Nicole's hair still sticky with green goo? So there is like an element of, was it a dream or was it not a dream? But the fact that we end the main story with that Cara came squealing around the corner and knocked you over, you hit your head, Sasha, you've been out cold ever since. That's how we end the book. Like we end the actual book with, it was all a dream. But even though Sappy says, oh, why did she have given her hair? It gives that idea that maybe it wasn't a dream, but it was a dream. Like it was. That's all it was, it was all a dream. It's just trying to put like a little bit of doubt in your mind, but it does end up just being a dream. And I hate that so much. For me, it's the worst Goosebumps book. I'm just fed up with Monster Blood. <laughs> it needs to retire. And I honestly hate dream endings. It ruins everything that comes before. And what came before was not that great anyway. So this one ended up getting a 1.00. It's the lowest rating you could possibly ever have for any kind of book with a core pile system, unless I saw it doing like 0 0.5, 0 0.5. But I'm not gonna do that. It was a one across the board genuinely did not like it. Fifth Grade Zombies does bring things back up a little bit and I gave this one a 3.86 out of 10. This one we follow Todd who goes to live on his aunt and uncle's farm and he has to live there for about a year because his parents are off doing research or going off doing some kind of job. Can you hear that? It's the wind and the rain here right now is awful. It's so bad outside. <laughs> it's so dark right now too and it's only like 2.30 p.m. right now. So we do meet Todd's cousins, Miller and Skipper, and there is like this weird, vague, almost like an urban legend about a whole class 
of kids that ended up going missing years before on a school trip. It leads to some like really good investigative scenes with Todd. He ends up finding a abandoned school bus with a shoe and a foot in it, which was like kind of gross, but also like really scary. Like I thought that R.R. Stein gave this book a little bit more tension, a bit more scares, which is what the previous few books have lacked. And I kind of like the direction of the story of this. It turns out that the kids who went missing got turned into zombies and they've been kept in a room called Room 5Z and they've been getting fed canned meat so that it would stop them from eating actual people. But then it turns out that more people are actually zombies and it's almost like this whole place has zombies. I do wish we had explored that a little bit more. I, this is like an assumption that maybe everyone who's like at that school or everyone here. It doesn't explain like if the whole place has zombies and if there are different levels of zombies because the zombie kids who are in that room, who are locked in that room, seem to be more aggressive as zombies and the ones who are outside who are feeding them, they seem to be more of a, a reasonable kind of zombie. I do love the like chase to the cornfield and as I said there are some like tense moments in this and I do kind of like the ending of it with, <laughs> although I, I, I like the ending, I'm just gonna say I like the ending, with the kids being like, oh, why don't you become a zombie as well? It doesn't hurt. And then Todd like thinks about it. He says, well, if I let you turn me into a zombie, can I play my harmonica in your band? Yeah, sure, fine, Mila said. Okay, then I said, let's do it. Like, <laughs> so he's gonna be a zombie because he wants to play harmonica in their band? And that was so out of nowhere. It was so random. Just like the dog in the previous book, but like, I, I still, even though it was random, I still kind of like that because it does mean that it is a better cliffhanger and I don't know if Todd does end up getting turned into a zombie and if he gets to play harmonica in their band, like, it's fine. I gave it a decent-ish rating. It was entertaining at points. Judy and the Beast, which was the fifth and final book that I read yesterday, this one gets an average of 3.71 out of 10. It was okay, it was like a very okay book. Nothing offensive, nothing that really made me go, oh, you know what, I wish I wasn't reading this right now. And this one we follow Judy and her dad and her older brother, they go off on these like little vacations together that Judy's never invited to. That instantly made red flags for me because I'm like, hmm, why? Why is it that the dad always takes the brother but not Judy? So Judy ends up like sneaking onto their next sort of trip up the mountain. And like the twist in the plot of this reminds me of other Goosebumps books. I'm trying to remember which ones they were. Maybe I could liken it to some of the werewolf books. But essentially what it turns out to be as is that Judy's dad has been taking the brother there is because he has been turning into a beast and he's being taken there so that he can get the help he needs to prevent him from turning into a beast all year round. And Judy's obviously never been invited because it's dangerous. And we spend all of this book with Judy having seen the beast and trying to convince people that she saw it rather than anything actual good or scary happening. This happens so much in these books where, like say it with fifth grade zombies as well, a lot of this book was Todd trying to convince people who already know everything that what he saw was true. So we're having another exact kind of formula with this one. Judy trying to convince everyone what she saw was true and everyone just gaslighting her instead. Only for everything to come out at the end. And it does turn out that Judy might also be turning into a beast because we end with her growing fur. I saw my arms and screamed. My arms were covered in thick brown fur. So what's happening to her brother is gonna to happen to her. So she'll probably end up having to go to this mountain every year to prevent her from turning a beast all year round. Also like, is it my hairiest adventure or the bargain go? I don't know. There's been so many kind of books like this where something similar has happened. So again, I didn't really find anything original with it. It wasn't a boring read. It wasn't offensive, as I've said, but not a whole lot to say about it. Genuinely just fine. Here we have A Nightmare on Elm Street meets Slappy. And you know what? I really do like the concept and I do think parts of this book worked. Other parts didn't, of course. And this one we follow Richard and his dad has given him Slappy. And his mum works at this sort of sleep lab at the hospital where Richard ends up taking Slappy. And just for fun, they decide to hook some wires to Slappy's head to, you know, I, well, I don't know why. <laughs> but they're kind of shocked to see that Oh, Slappy actually has some brainwaves? What? He's supposed to be a wooden dummy. But it really does, again, like add something a little bit new and fresh to the Living Dummy series. Because after this, Richard starts to have dreams and Slappy is invading his dreams. He's doing things in his dreams that kind of happen in real life. And I know I said like with Monster Blood is back, 
I hated the fact that that wrapped up as always hold a dream. This one is essentially set during dreams, which I should probably dislike, but I don't because I think it works in here. Like the actual plot is revolving around these dreams where something happens in them and then it kind of happens in real life. You know, we've turned Slappy into a bit of a Freddy Krueger kind of character, which honestly, like it does work. That whole concept works very well. And I do applaud Oro Stein for giving us something fresh with it. Slappy's sort of hijinks are again like really petty and childish to the point where it is below the age range in my opinion. So we do fall back on those tropes of just like rinse and repeat when it comes to a lot of Slappy's dialogue will have a moment of ingenuity with the plot but Slappy as a character himself just constantly remains the same which is both a good and bad thing but we have had Slappy for 30 years now I believe in the Goosebumps world like in the real world Slappy has been alive since the 90s and he's still pretty much the same with his really awful jokes and childish pranks. What I do like about this book, actually, I do quite like the ending. I like the little twist because even like the mum believes what's happening and I like it when the parents do actually start believing their children. I think it's a really nice change to the norm. And it's happened quite a few times in the Slappy World series, so I wonder if R.L. Stein might have thought, oh, you know, I was doing a lot of books where the parents were just god awful. I mean, not to say that they haven't been bad in the Slappy World series because they kind of have as well, but it's been a more balanced mix. And yeah, so they take Sappy back to the dream lab and Richard believes that if he goes into his dream and he reads the magic words, he can put Sappy to sleep. However, when that happens, it turns out that they've switched bodies. So now Sappy is in Richard's body. And I like that ending. It's, it's definitely a lot more interesting and better executed than a lot of the twist endings. Pleasant dreams, dummy. Yeah, it was pretty decent. I gave this one a 4.43 out of 10. Definitely one of the better Slappy books in the series and parts of it were a little bit haunting. So I have to give a props for the atmosphere that it was conveying, but I am so ready to say goodbye to Slappy. One more book in this series deals with Slappy and I couldn't be happier. Horn with the Stars feels a lot like Earth Geeks Must Go from the Series 2000 series. And I personally wasn't really a big fan of this. I do want a really great sci-fi-esque book. I feel like the closest we've gone to that is Invasion of the Body Snatchers, parts one and two of Series 2000. From what I remember, I kind of liked those books. Oh my gosh, do I already need a reread? <laughs> I'm not rereading the Goosebumps books, but I do remember that kind of dealt with aliens and and things like that. So I did like that one, but I haven't had a really good sci-fi Goosebumps book in such a long time. Nothing that's really floored me or wowed me. And this one definitely didn't either. We follow Murphy who is on a school trip to an observatory. He and his friends, they end up coming across somebody who wants to do an experiment on them. We meet Dr. Sydney Rayburn. And instead of letting the kids go, they end up deciding that, oh, I'm going to do an experiment on you because I've been working on this machine. The kids don't even get a choice in the matter. Like, it's stranger danger. They should be arrested and put in jail. This is weird. But Murphy and his friends do end up getting transported to another planet. Like, the machine is supposed to transport them to another planet in the blink of an eye. So that's what they do. They get transported to another planet. And I like the idea. Honestly, the idea was there. But then we get onto this planet and everyone has like two heads, which is fine. Like that is kind of scary, but it just turns like ridiculous by the end of it. There is like a king of this planet who essentially just wants them to dance forever. That's essentially what it all builds up to. Murphy and his friends are treated as different in this other planet. And it seems like, you know, one headed people are the scary ones, which I kind of like the commentary on that, the social commentary on people being different. But everyone just wants them to dance essentially. And there's just nothing really scary about that. Even the planet itself isn't really described very well and it seems like whenever we do have another planet, like say Planet of the Lone Gnomes, everything looks exactly like Earth, everyone speaks English and there's no creativity behind that. Horner with the Stars is a little bit of a letdown because it doesn't explore any of that kind of otherworldly extraterrestrial stuff that it kind of promises with like haunting with the stars. Like there aren't, you don't really get to see any stars. There isn't a haunting. It's a bit of a misleading title. So I gave this one a 2.36 out of 10. And I'm praying that one day, because there is going to be another Goosebumps main series after this, that there will be a really great, exciting sci-fi horror in the Goosebumps world. Set on a different planet. Is that too much to ask? 
Slappy Beware is a special edition. It's not exactly part of the Slappy World line. This is in book number 18, for instance. This was just released between book 17 and 18, so that's why I've included it here. And I do think it slots in with the Slappy World series, just based off of vibes, based off the fact that, again, we have all to do with Slappy. And I believe this was released for the 30th anniversary for Goosebumps last year. So it does feel a little bit special. I love the illustrations. Like, the illustrations are really good. There's only four of them, but they do accompany each part because it's split into four parts. And I think I'm gonna put this on the thumbnail because I really like this image. And I quite like the hardback feature of it. I love the illustrations. It, it felt different. You know, even though it wasn't really that different, some of it was, some of it was very interesting, some of it went back to the tired cliches of living dummy slappy books. Even though I'm sick of hearing about slappy's origin, because R.L. Stein changes it every single time. There is no consistency with the history of Slappy. He's said to be, you know, made of the wood of a coffin one minute, but then he's made by a sorcerer the next minute. And there's just so much back and forth between Slappy's actual origin. I'm like, R.L. Stein, please can you just make up your mind and just stick with it? Or like, let's just not visit Slappy again. Let's retire him. So part one is the origin story. We follow a sorcerer who is making Slappy and yeah, I feel like we already had something very, very similar to that in one of them. Was it I Am Slappy's Evil Twin? It was one of the other Slappy books where we got the introduction, like a prologue-esque type thing. It does remind me as well of Wanted the Haunted Mask, how we had the origin of the Haunted Mask in that story in a prologue. But yeah, nothing too special about part one. Part two, I kind of like in a way because it calls back to Mr. Wood from the original series and we also had Mr. Wood earlier in the Goosebumps Happy World series as well. And so I do like those callbacks, but the story itself does go back on the whole live and dummy formula. I do also like the fact that we learn that Mr. Wood is a line of dummies, almost a bit like, you know, how you can get Barbie dolls from a store and things like that. That was pretty cool. And it is like Mr. Wood throughout that part one, but actually it does turn out to be Slappy, pretend to be Mr. Wood. So I kind of like that, but also it reminds me of the original Night of the Living Dummy book because the original Night of the Living Dummy book, the antagonist is Mr. Wood and then Slappy is the cliffhanger of that book. It felt nice to go back to that. Part three was actually like pretty funny. It follows Slappy trying to terrorize this family, but every single time he tries to do something mischievous, it falls through. Like for example, he drills a hole into a boat, but the family take a different boat or he ruins a cake and the mum finds it funny so they go and buy a cake. And it's just like everything seems to, you know, not go to plan with Slappy. And there is the idea that we got in part one that he is forced to do an evil deed every single day, otherwise he'll sleep forever. That's sort of like the rules that the sorcerer gave him. And so Slappy is desperate to do an evil deed and it to go through before the end of the day. It was funny to see every single plan of his, every single stupid prank that he was trying to pull, just not go to plan. So I like the change of that. Part four does continue on from part three, and that's when Sabi is visited by the sorcerer. The sorcerer tells him, oh, you don't have to be evil every day anymore. You can be good. When Sabi says he plans to be evil, the sorcerer puts him to sleep with the magic words. And I don't understand this because in the epilogue, Sabi wakes up and turns out that he actually had earbuds in so he couldn't hear the magic words. And I'm just like, one, when did he put the earbuds in? Two, if he didn't hear the magic words, why did he fall asleep? Three, if he had the earbuds in the entire time, then how did he even converse with the sorcerer to begin with? Did he just magically start playing something, like, out of nowhere, as soon as the magic words started? Like, wh what was he playing? I just don't understand that. Like, it was a really stupid ending. I gave it a 3.79. Not terrible in the grand scheme of things, considering things have gotten a lot lower in the series, but I, I like the little bit of a change of the formula. There is quite a bit of added padding at the end. Almost like a little behind the scenes kind of thing. We've got Stabby's most iconic insults, which are just awful. You need a checkup from the neck up. Is that your face or did you forget to take out the garbage? Is that your face or you stand on your head? Some of these insults we've already seen in the books. I think these are just the ones that R.L. Stein thought were the funniest. You also dummy your sleep all night studying how to pick your nose. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was in, what book was that one in? I'm sure, was it Ghost of Slappy? My IQ is so high, I need a lot of client. Just not anything funny. Jokes on you. Knock knock, who's there? Jane, Jane who? Jane your clothes, you stink. What did the doctor say when the Invisible Man came to his office? Sorry, I can't see you now. 
know why I get invited to so many parties because I'm a scream. And then we do actually have an interview between Arl Stein and Slappy. I think that's so cute. I love the idea of a creator interviewing one of their creations. Even though nothing funny or anything happened during the interview, it was rather silly. I still like the idea of it. I would love to see a video version of something like this where R.L. Stein meets Slappy or like talks to Slappy and interviews him. Maybe there is something like that already. Cause I just think of Walt Disney with Mickey Mouse. We've got R.L. Stein with Slappy. It's kind of a beautiful relationship between creator and creation. So yeah, I do wish this was slightly better for the 30th anniversary, but it is what it is. We stumble so much on the penultimate Slappy World book. This one felt very chicken chicken in a few other of the original Goosebumps books back in the day. It kind of leans heavily into that formula. So we follow Cooper and he wants to make a zombie film in the woods for a, a project. And his younger sister Anna, she comes along. She ends up getting bitten by a bird. I don't think even looks like this because the description of the bird is nothing like that at all. This is false advertisement. <laughs> yeah, the bird is called Oggy and Anna decides to take the bird home and she starts to exhibit behaviors of a bird, just like in Chicken Chicken, when the main characters begin to turn into chickens. And a little bit like Samantha Bird at the end of Be Careful What You Wish For. But yeah, Anna's kind of sitting on eggs. She's kind of, well, she gets herself up in a tree then she's down the next minute. She does really weird bird type things. That does concern Cooper and he tries to research this bird no idea what it is. But essentially it is just a story all about how Anna is acting weird and being all bird-like. It does make sense. Then Anna bites Cooper and he starts to exhibit behaviours of a bird too. And nothing scary or anything happens. Like it just goes from sort of like scene to scene with just like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? Why is she acting like that? Why am I starting to act like this? Very, very basic. But then it turns out that the parents were actually giving them some kind of special juice this entire time to turn them into birds because they want to be a perfect bird family. And that just came out of nowhere, in my opinion. I didn't read anything like that beforehand to indicate that the parents were even doing that. The parents were a little bit neglectful, yes, and a bit weird, but nothing different really to most Goosebumps parents. But the fact that they've been experimenting on their children all this time without telling them, without their consent, I'm like, wow, I think I found the worst Goosebumps parents. And yeah, then at the end, the family just fly out the window. <laughs> <laughs> it is stupid. Dad opened the kitchen window. We all held hands for a moment and took a deep breath. Then we flapped off feathered arms and flew off over the trees. <laughs> oh my god, that's just so stupid. Oh my god. Honestly, this is the second last Goosebumps book I needed to read. I'm just, oh, I'm so done. Why? Why does it have to be that dumb? That oh, ridiculous. I did not like it. 1.93. It probably should be a lot lower. It should be one of the worst. It is one of the worst ones. But goddamn, this made me so worried about the final book. I thought we're gonna end on such a low note here. But actually, I did kind of like Fright Night. How do I say it? Do I just say Fright Night? It's Fright Night, but I don't like saying that. Fright Night. This last book in the Goosebumps Happy World series, I gave a 4.07. Considering it's at least above a four, that's all I can ask for. And definitely way better than Night of the Squawker. This one gave Creature Teacher vibes in a little way. We follow Kelly, who goes to a new town, goes to a new school, and he meets the school monster. And all of the big schools have a monster. It's almost like a mascot kind of thing. And they keep this monster in the sort of basement. And once a year there is Fright Night and one of the kids has to be the monster's date. And there is a, like a 10% chance that the monster's gonna eat you. And it's so weird how accepting everyone is of that. It's a bit like Creature Teacher in that regard. Like whoever's bottom of the list is one who gets eaten by Mrs. Mog. I actually don't know what Arvel Stein's fascination is with the sort of repetition of the, the letters in the middle, like Mrs. Mog, Fright Night, you know, like when it comes to monsters. But even the parents of Kelly are like, oh, well, you know, if you get eaten by the monster, that's fine. <laughs> They're trying to assure him that that's not gonna happen, but even the slightest chance that you're putting these kids in danger like that is just so weird to me. But you know what? I kind of let all my inhibitions go to just simply enjoy the story. The friends that Kelly meets, they do end up trying to steal another school's monster mascot in order to try and be like each other's date so that Kelly will be safe. But it really does like drag in the middle here. It feels like Arlstein doesn't know what he's doing with the story because it just drags. 
<laughs> until we finally get to Fright Night, where nothing really happens. The two monsters they end up being like a date of each other, and so the Fright Night goes really well. And then at the end, Miss Waxman, she goes up to Kelly and she's like, I'm putting you in charge of Scary Saturday. Excuse me, I said, Scary Saturday, what's that? She turned to me, that's our next party. Haven't you met the monster in the music room? <laughs> Again, a bit of a silly ending, but it didn't ruin what came before it really, which was just kind of a, a fun time. Little parts of it were a bit scary in terms of the monster. I think this could have been worse and Orlstein could have taken it in a worse direction. And I'm giving him props for not taking it in a worse direction. <laughs> Seriously, the bar is low, but it, it was a good ending to the series. Is this one of the highest ratings I've given the last book in a series? It's the highest rated finale Goosebumps book since series 2000. This got a higher rating than the final book in Horrorland, Hall of Horrors, and Most Wanted. And it's even better than the final book of Goosebumps, the original series. So this is like the second best Goosebumps main series ending book. So that is like a really good thing. But I am done. I have finished all of the Goosebumps main series books, not including the brand new House of Shivers one, because again, I'm probably just gonna wait until that series finishes before I even tackle that one, which will be a good few years yet. So let's rank the Goosebumps Slappy World books from worst to best, give you the series average for Goosebumps Slappy World in the hopes that it overtook the previous few Goosebumps main series and my final thoughts on Goosebumps Slappy World and modern day Goosebumps. Remember that my ranking and my ratings of the Goosebumps Slappy World series are all my own opinions and it's absolutely fine if you disagree with my thoughts and feelings on these books. And I do urge you to leave a comment, let me know all of your thoughts, but please be respectful. And yeah, this is just all my opinions, nothing serious, enjoy. <laughs> so in 20th place and my least favorite Goosebumps Slappy World book and potentially my least favorite Goosebumps book ever, that is Monster Blood is back with a rating of 1.00 out of 10. And number 19 is Please Do Not Feed the Weirdo with an average of 1.29 out of 10. And number 18 is I Am Slappy's Evil Twin with a rating of 1.86 out of 10. And number 17 is Night of the Squawker with an average of 1.93 out of 10. And number 16 is They Call Me the Night Squawker with an average of 2.00 out of 10. And number 15 is Revenge of the Invisible Boy with an average of 2.29 out of 10. And number 14 is Haunting with the Stars with an average of 2.36 out of 10. And number 13 is Slappy Birthday to You with a rating of 2.43 out of 10. And number 12 is My Friend Slappy with a rating of 2.86 out of 10. And number 11 is Attack of the Jack with a rating of 3.29 out of 10. And number 10 is Judy and the Beast with a rating of 3.71 out of 10. And number 9 is Slappy Beware with a rating of 3.79 out of 10. And number 8 is Fifth Grade Zombies with a rating of 3.86 out of 10. And number 7 is Diary of a Dummy with a rating of 4.00 out of 10. And number 6 is Fright Night with a rating of 4.07 out of 10. And number 5 is Slappy in Dreamland with a rating of 4.43 out of 10. In number 4 is The Ghost of Slappy with a rating of 5.00 out of 10. In number 3 is Escape from Shudder Mansion with a rating of 5.14 out of 10. In number 2 and the runner up is The Dummy Meets the Mummy with a rating of 5.57 out of 10. In my number 1, my most favourite of the Goosebumps Slappy World books by a clear margin, is It's Alive, It's Alive with a rating of 6.86 out of 10. If you would just skip to this section of the video because you wanted to see my ranking, there are timestamps down below if you want me to talk about any of these books more in depth. I just wanted to rank them from worst to best. All of my thoughts are previously in this video, so do check those thoughts out. But honestly, I'm really rather happy with overall how the Sappy World series turned out. I had quite low expectations because I wasn't a fan of Slappy after a while and a whole series where he tells the stories and him being featured in a lot of them just made me feel like it was going to be a bad series. But actually turns out that a few of the Slappy Living Dummy books are some of my favourites from this series. I'm so surprised that I gave It's Alive, It's Alive such a high rating. This is the highest rating I've given anything since the very start of the Horrorland series and only one book from that series got higher than this one. So really like this was up there with a lot of the series 2000 and the original Goosebumps books for me, which is such a surprise. I really enjoyed it. And actually I'm quite surprised at how high some of the Slappy books have ranked. Five of the top 10 are Slappy books. Before I reveal my overall average for the Slappy World series to see where it ranks with the previous main series that I've covered on this channel, let's go back to the start and see what the averages for the previous series were. So the original Goosebumps series over 62 books has an average of 5.32 out of 10. It would have been higher had the series not gone on so long and it does have a lot of stinkers in that that really drags the average down but still to this day I do feel like 
the original Goosebumps series is my favourite series. There's just too many iconic books in that series for it not to be. Goosebumps series 2000 has an average of 5.94 out of 10, which is definitely higher and the best average I have so far on these Goosebumps book series. But that is mainly because there are only 25 books in the Goosebumps series 2000 series, whereas there are 62 in the original series. So if there were 62 books in series 2000, I could bet you the average would have likely dropped below the original series. But as it stands, series 2000 has the highest average and looks to be my favourite series, <laughs> average-wise. Goosebumps Horrorland has an average of 3.84 out of 10. It really dropped after the original 90s series of the original series and the 2000 series. So we entered into kind of modern day Goosebumps and I just haven't really vibed with modern day Goosebumps too well. I feel like they've been very gimmicky and rely too much on the original series to rehash stories and rehash plots that we've already seen. Very formulaic, very tropey, not well written half the time. So it is a shame that from Horrorland onwards, Oral Sign has kind of fallen into the modern day era of Goosebumps trap. The whole of horror series, despite only being six weeks long, has an average of 3.71. The Goosebumps Most Wanted series has an average of 3.44 out of 10. I feel like even after we find out the overall average of the Sappy World series, I think Overall, out of all the series, the Most Wanted series is my least favourite series. Too many missed opportunities. It does not deliver on anything that it promises. And there isn't really very many standout books from that series, apart from Wanted, The Haunted Mask. And I did like Son of Slappy in that series, but nothing else from that really stands out. So the average of Goosebumps Slappy World is... 3.39 out of 10. Unfortunately, it does drop just a little bit below Most Wanted for overall average. Some of these books in this Slappy World series really dragged the average down, especially Monster Blood is Back, my least favourite Goosebumps book ever. Honestly, if it wasn't for that book, if that book wasn't as bad as it was, the average would have made it above Most Wanted, which is where I really wanted it to be. But I think in my heart, I do prefer Sappy World over Most Wanted. But it's really cool to see the averages and how they played out. They dropped dramatically after Series 2000, and the modern day era Goosebumps have stayed pretty consistent between a three and a four out of 10. So I've got to admire that consistency. But that does mean that I don't have any more main Goosebumps series to cover. House of Shivers has only just begun and will not be finishing for a few more years. So I won't be covering that anytime soon. I I do have all of the tales to give you Goosebumps books, so that is the first of a sort of spin-off series that I might cover next year, which I own them, so I, I think I will. I'll read each short story on its own and maybe rate those, I don't know. Then there is also Give Yourself Goosebumps, but I don't think I will ever be able to cover that series, even though I have some really good ideas for that vlog if I do, including giving myself three lives for each book and kind of not rating it the same way as I would rate other Goosebumps books because they are choose your own adventure books, but they are really expensive to get. They are out of print and I don't own very many of them. I only own about like five or six from the original UK releases. And looking online, it would cost me around about 1,300 to 1,400 pounds to collect them. And I unfortunately don't make enough to justify spending that much on Give Yourself Goosebumps. As much as I really want to, I don't think I will ever be able to do it. So who knows, maybe one day someone will put all of them on eBay for a really decent price that I could go for. But I just can't justify spending that much money on those books, unfortunately. So Tales to Give You Goosebumps will most likely be the next one sometime in 2024. But as it stands, this was the end of the Goosebumps main series on my channel. And it's been two years in the making. I'm rather emotional. <sighs> but alas, our main Goosebumps journey is over. So thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave this video a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all the comments down below, let me know what you thought of the Goosebumps Happy World series. Do you have any standout books, any books that you hate from it, anything you agreed or disagreed with me in the video, let me know down below. And I'll give a huge thank you to my patrons and my One Piece channel members for supporting my channel. If you'd like to join my Patreon or my One Piece channel membership, then all the links are down in the description box. But yeah, I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye.